Outside of Psalm 23, this is probably the most memorized of all the Psalms. It's interesting, it's the only Psalm that is called a Psalm of Thanksgiving. Out of 150 Psalms that talks about Thanksgiving, this is the only one with a superscription that says a Psalm of Thanksgiving. And uh, we see then it's the crescendo of the Psalms that started in Psalm 92 and went on through uh, here, talking about the Lord as king. Um, and of course, uh, these, most of these psalms, if not all, were written after the captivity when Israel didn't have a king on earth. And so they were talking about the Messiah, the Messiah king. And so uh, and with that new temple, we see the, the whole idea of worship. And one of the reasons we sing songs before we go into preaching or whatever else is because that's what the Lord says to do. Excuse me. So notice in verse 1 of Psalm 100, he says, Make a joyful shout or joyful noise to the Lord, all ye lands. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come before his presence with singing. Know ye that the Lord, he is God. It is he who has made us and not we ourselves. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Enter into his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise. Be thankful to him and bless his name. For the Lord is good, his mercy is everlasting, and his truth endures to all generations. And so we see now, you can just imagine as these people are marching into the temple or marching down the streets to go into the temple, how, notice we have to get our hearts ready to receive God's word. Open my heart, my mind, Lord, uh, that I may receive your word. Uh, do we pray that before we start the service? Lord, uh, you know, uh, come thou fount of every blessing. Tune my heart to sing thy praise. Streams of mercy never ceasing. Call, sing thy grace. <laughs> there again, again. Streams of mercy never ceasing. Call for songs of loudest praise. And so we see that, uh, you know, tune me up, Lord, and that's one reason we sing. And of course, another reason we sing is not for evangelism. We don't see anywhere in the Bible where it says we sing songs to evangelize, although people should see by our hearts that they, they might want something that we have, but we don't directly go out and sing to them because uh, that's not, they, what we want to see is, for, or want them to see is the joy in our hearts. He hath put a new song in my mouth, even praise unto the Lord. Many shall see it and fear and shall trust the Lord. Well, that's because what God's doing to me. But uh, then they will see what God's doing in my life because of the joy in my life. And so, you know, even whether we have a big crowd or a small crowd on Sunday morning, let's pray that God will give us a spirit of thanksgiving, a song, a song of praise, I want it to, um, where I and I've had people say, you know, I've just come to church there and I just feel God's presence. Well, that's what we want. And part of it is because we sing. And so let's sing with uh, a joyful noise, with a joyful shout. Let's sing with conviction. Let's sing with, uh, with all of our heart and, and knowing that um, singing really puts us in a mood to pray, to worship, I know uh, I've gotten where now, and I praise the Lord for this good radio station that we have now. But uh, I uh, many times will just turn it over there, and I'm hoping to find, but they, they're all usually playing some very good music. Or I'll get a CD and I'll stick in my car. And I think one, that's one thing I'd like to do here is start getting more CDs into the hands of our people. Um, or what, what, however else we can do it. CDs are old fashioned now, I guess. So they're not even, are they even putting CDs in cars anymore? Or are they going to this new thing that you just plug? Yeah. Okay, so even, boy, it shows you how far behind I am. So how do we get music into the hands or to the ears of people? But, uh, oh, that we can sing. And uh, I try to incorporate a lot of songs into my messages because I want it to, uh, that, uh, of course, the, the words of the songs, because I want them to mean something to us. And so come before his presence with singing, a joyful shout. Um, you know, a lot of times I think of even um, what they'll do in, in sports. I remember one time 
I was went back home to watch my uh, high school play in a game that if they won, they were going to go on to better things. And so um, as I, I was already in the service at the time, but I still was loyal to my school. So I went to watch them and they were playing, uh, they were called Lyman High School in Longwood, Florida. And, uh, but I could tell just the way that they were subdued and the way that the, the guys from Lyman were singing, oh, we're not singing, but boy, they were pumped up and they were ready to go. I could tell, uh, we're not going to do too well. And I think they lost 39 to 6 or something like that, you know, because just something about the atmosphere, they weren't ready to really throw everything into it. They weren't optimistic about it, I guess, or whatever. Well, when we come before the Lord, should we not? And you say, well, my, that was over 50 years ago. Isn't it interesting how that sticks in your mind? But uh, when people come to church here, I want that to stick in their mind. Hey, listen, uh, not a big group of people, but boy, they sure love the Lord. Or they, there's something about, the, they sing. Uh, you know, uh, I was talk, uh, heard about Spurgeon, and he didn't have a song leader. And many times he would just get up, but they would say that the, the music came from the pews. And it was just amazing how that people sang in his services. And no wonder he was such, you know, that people were prepared to hear his messages. And that was back before microphones and everything else. And can you imagine speaking to four or 5,000, sometimes 6,000 people without a microphone? I mean, that took a lot. There had to be a lot of presence of the Lord in that tabernacle and so forth. And so we see that uh, make a joyful shout. That let's get, a, get in the mood. Tune me up, Lord, and let's sing to the Lord. All ye lands, that's an appeal. That's, you know, if that's evangelism, hey, come and sing with us. Get into the mood and come and worship the Lord with us. And so that's about as close to evangelism as you're going to get. All ye lands, everybody, come and sing with us. We'd love to have you. And so uh, all ye lands, an appeal to every person to sing to the one true God. And so if we're going to sing to the one true God, let's make sure the message is clear and plain and that they know that whenever we're singing, that we're singing to the God of heaven and uh, we're not singing, you light up my life or whatever, where you don't know who that, whether you're talking to your lover or to the Lord. And how many of these songs are like that today where they could, they call them crossover and you could sing them to your, to your, I guess lover is the wrong word these days because that's taken too, uh, but I think uh, you're the person that you're in love with, let's put it that way, or to the Lord. And so, again, uh, let's make sure that whenever we sing, people know we're singing to the Lord because his name is above every name and we don't want to equate anything that we do when we're praising the Lord with man or even anything close to it. So all ye lands, come, let's pray. Serve the Lord with gladness as though it's a marriage feast. Now, the one thing you don't want to do when you go to a, a wedding is to look sad, do you? Unless you're the person who got jilted. <laughs> no, but, uh, you know, but that'd be the only reason you would uh, go sad. But if you're going to go to a wedding, they expect you to at least have a smile on your face. Now, of course, back in these days, uh, of course, with the bridegroom and the parade through the town and all those things. You remember the Lord giving several uh, illustrations of marriage feasts. But they, people were happy. They, they were, they, their hearts were merry. And, they, and so we see that uh, when you come to the Lord, hey, listen, let's sing. And we see time after time, God's people are singing people. You know, uh, come into his courts with praise. Um, he tells us in... Ephesians 5, uh, be not drunk with wine, but be ye filled with the Spirit, singing to yourselves in, spirit, in songs and hymns and spiritual songs. So we see that uh, we're to sing to ourselves and to sing to one another. How do we encourage one another? Uh, not neglecting the assembling of ourselves together, but the, as a matter of some is, but exhorting one another. One of the best ways to exhort one another is singing. Smile a while and give your face a rest. Point your hand to the one you love the best. Then shake hands with one nearby and greet them with a smile. We got to say, hey, that would be a good one to, to change a little bit, wouldn't it? Will it? Could you get the music for that? I heard that when I, at a church I was in. I don't know why I've incorporated it, but I heard that when I was in the Navy. I don't know why it just popped in my mind. 
Well, that would be a good one to do. And greet them with a smile. So uh, uh, have you ever heard that? You have? Okay, so maybe we could find it. But, uh, you know, encourage you one another. And so uh, people come into church, as we said, I think a couple of weeks ago, you don't know where they're coming from. I mean, as I, we talked about that one lady who was really coming from a life of sin, and boy, did she see the difference between church and her, her living conditions. And uh, she realized, hey, there's a big difference. And shouldn't that be the way it is? Uh, I hope this church is different than where you work. That the, the atmosphere when you get here is totally different than anything else. And you want to be here because this is where people love you. This is where you really sense God's moving. Uh, hey, that's what we, you know, that's, that's worship. That's when we do it. It's contagious. So we want to have that contagious praise, as Psalm 34 says. And so we see that uh, he says, serve the Lord with gladness. And that word service, there again, which is your reasonable service of worship, that's uh, 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 Revelation, excuse me, Romans 12, 2, uh, uh, which is our reasonable, 12, 1 and 2. And so it's our reasonable service of worship. So let's be reasonable and let's praise the Lord. And so serve the Lord with gladness. Hey, it's good to be in the house of the Lord today as with uh, when we're, as, as we're going to a wedding feast. Come before his presence with singing. I like what Spurgeon says here, singing as if as it is joyful and at the same time a devout exercise should be a constant form of approach to God. Now, exercise means you got to do it. You got to just got kind of to decide that I'm going to do it no matter how I feel. And really, when you do it, that's a sacrifice of praise when you don't feel like it. And so whenever I'm going to go ahead and praise God, in spite of the way I feel, then I am really, that's a sacrifice of praise, as other places or in uh, Scripture say. So again, can we, can we sacrifice without, you know, when we, when we sacrifice our feelings for God's feelings, that's great. When we sacrifice our feelings for others, that's kindness, isn't it? So again, we see that uh, we want to be kind to the Lord and kind to other people. So it's that contagious, less joyful praise that, that you can imagine now they're going and they're getting ready to go into the temple. And this wasn't a, a solemn dirge. This was a, hey, listen, this is the Lord. This is the, the, uh, the day the Lord has made. Let's rejoice and be glad in it. And that was actually talking about the Sabbath, or excuse me, talking about the first day of the week. That, of course, talking about the revelation, the, uh, the resurrection. So then we see, in, uh, we see not only is it joyful praise, but it is intelligent praise. It's not just let's throw a fit and, you know, whatever. But know ye that the Lord is good. The, the, the Lord, he is God. Now, no, there is no by experience. Know from the bottom of your heart that he's God. And if he's God, then he, it is he that hath made us and not we ourselves. So we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus, unto good works, which the Bible tells us in uh, Ephesians 2, 11. And so if we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus, unto good works, let's sing to the praise of his glory, which is Ephesians 1. And so we see that, uh, that there's... You know, where the Lord is, there should be joy. Because, and where the Lord is, there should be goodness because those are all characteristics of, those are attributes of his person. If the Bible tells us the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, then those are attributes that God has, that he has departed, that he's given to us. And as Second Peter says, he has imparted to us his divine nature. And so isn't God love? First John chapter 4, God is love. He's the joy of the Spirit. Peace, he is our peace, as Paul told Timothy. And so those are all attributes of God. So Lord, I want those attributes in my life. And oh Lord, I mean, and so I'm going to really, that's a trigger mechanism. If I will sing to the Lord, maybe, uh, and I just keep thinking, maybe God will start uh, reflecting it back on me. You know, 
There again, if I bring him glory, guess what? God can glorify his servants. And so again, we see this idea of know ye that the Lord, he is God. And of course, it, he, and here's another one of those verses, and I just gave you several other verses here, like Psalm 119, 79, Psalm 139, 13, in thy book all my members were written, which, con which in continuous for fashion, when as yet there was none of them. That tells us that God knew every chromosome of your body before you were even thought of by your parents. That's something, isn't it? And so this whole idea that, that we have today is nothing more than to destabilize nature and to destabilize our God-given rights and the God-given stability. We are endowed by our Creator with certain inalienable rights, unalienable rights. And so we see that um, God has given us certain things that, that if the government takes, us away, takes them away from us, they're oppressing us. But we do have a right uh, before God, I mean, God-given right, to seek Him. And that's where we're going to find happiness. It's a pursuit of happiness and to seek His will. But, of course, uh, man decides not to. Well, that's, there again, it's his right not to. We're Americans, so we can't force people. But we can sure show them what they can have if they will give, give their hearts to the Lord. Anytime that you force somebody to believe something, you're oppressing them. Think about it. They, you want the people to believe it because God said it or because it's true. Or, or what, if, it's, if God said it, it will be true. But uh, we are living in a day now where the government tells us something that is false and then they say, if you don't believe it, you know, this whole idea, how many people today are being called bigots because they won't go along with this woke philosophy and everything? Woke? I mean, wait a minute. You're denying, I like about that one athlete, uh, that girl, she said uh, she gotten all kinds of problems this past week about, uh, she said, you know, and she just uh, was said it on television that, uh, that men shouldn't be competing in the physical sports with women. And all of a sudden, all these people, including the network, said, you're a bigot. And she said, I'm not a bi bigot. I just believe in biology. <laughs> you know? And so they are trying to force us to believe something. It's that Orwellian thing where they tell you one thing and you believe it, and then the next week they tell you just the opposite or whatever. So no, you 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 got a mind you got a you got an at, so you can know these things have been written unto you that you may know by experience that you're a child of God. God wants you to know know ye that He is God that He is your God, and that as a result it is He that has made us, and not only did He make me but He saved me. Isn't that great? I mean, nothing I did, I, I, had, I had no, uh, I didn't do a bit of work in either one of those. I, I just popped into the world and, uh, you know, uh, and it wasn't a mistake. It was planned by God, anyway. That's planned parenthood, by the way, <laughs> truly. Uh, and so uh, God made me and then also, we know that he saved me. But I didn't, he called me, I didn't call him. Now, I called him as a response from him calling me. But he, how can I love him? Because he first loved me. So it is he that has made me and not myself. So anybody here, anybody under the sound of our, my voice, and by the way, we had five new people, I think, that were listening last Sunday or whatever, I saw that. But uh, anyone, God has you here for a purpose. And as a result of that, you know, he wants to impart upon you or into you the divine nature. And that's given to you whenever the Holy Spirit comes into your life, when the Lord Jesus comes into your life and makes you a temple of God. And so we are his, pe we are his uh, he is our creator, he's our savior. And then not only that, but we are his people. That's our, our relationship. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Now, we see then that uh, God is good. And also, we see that we are the sheep of his pasture. So what does that make him? The shepherd. 
Psalm 23, the Lord is my shepherd. Um, John chapter 10, verse 11, I am the good shepherd. And the, the good shepherd will give his life for his sheep. And that's what he did for us. So we see that, uh, he, that he is our creator and he is, uh, uh, we are his people. Why? Because we have accepted him as our savior. So we're worshiping him. So if we're worshiping him, should we not be thankful? Should we not be pra praising the Lord? Oh, I'm just saved and I'm just one of those oddballs in the world. I'm a peculiar person. No, that peculiar person means that you're peculiar because you're special not because you're worthless or odd or an odd duck or anything, but uh, God has made us and we are very special to him. We are his people and we're the sheep of his pasture. We want other people to join that pasture. And so that's the one thing about the Bible. It's, uh, of course, the, uh, the main uh, character in the Bible is the Lord Jesus the theme of the Bible is redemption by blood. And of course, we see the then, of the, then we see the message of the Bible is y'all come. The spirit and the bride say, come. So we tell people to come to the Lord. When the Lord uh, told Moses, uh, told Noah to go into, uh, he didn't say go into the ark. He said, come into the ark. Because where God is, is where there's safety. So come, come unto me, all ye that are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. He's my good shepherd. But we, and we are his sheep because he is our good shepherd. So we see not only, uh, so these are the things. We need to remind ourselves of that. Know ye that the Lord, he is God. So I had a bad week this week. God's still on the throne. As we saw last week, or we saw last Sunday, the Lord reigns. As long as he's reigning, and not R-A-I-N, but R-E-I-G-N, um, as long as he's, he's on the throne, everything is secure. Everything is all right in my Father's house, where there's joy, joy, joy. There can be no sin in my Father's house, where there's joy, joy, joy. So we see that uh, we have the intelligent. We need to go back to knowing what we know. I don't, there's several things right now that I'm confused about in the future, just to be honest with you. Sometimes I get a little perplexed, but there's, but th when I do that, I, you got to go back to where you, what you know. And what do I know? I know that he's God, he's on the throne, he saved me, and he's got a purpose for my life, and whatever he does is good. Now, I could add a lot of other things to it, but God is good, and that's what we'll see in a moment. He is the good shepherd. Do I know that? Well, I think so, Pastor. No, do you know it? You know, there go. Do you know by experience he's good? That's what we've got to, you know, uh, nobody else can uh, walk that uh, valley for you. I mean, but he'll lead you through the valley of the shadow of death and you'll fear no evil, but for he is with you. That's what you want to know. That's what you want to experience in your life. And so we see he's the good shepherd. And we, the, we go back to intelligent praise. I know whom I believe, and I'm convinced that he's able to keep that which I've committed unto him against that day. I'm convinced of it. Scared to death, but I've been convinced of it. <laughs> have you ever felt that way? Well, we all have. And so, Lord, I'm convinced, but you know my old flesh. You know, I'm uh, wondering about that tomorrow. And so, uh, Lord, but I'm going to hang on for dear life. Because I know in the end, this too shall pass. And when it passes, I'll still be with you because you promised me you'd never leave me or forsake me. And so I got to know that. I got to know it. Down deep inside, I got to know it. And then the not only intelligent praise, but then a thankful praise. We're just, um, when we say thankful, well, you say you're already praising the Lord. Well, thanking him for specific things. And so notice it says, enter to his gates with thanksgiving. Lord, it's been a great week. Thanks for the blessings. Thanks for food on my table. Thanks for whatever. I still love that story about Corey Bo Ten Boom's sister, who uh, uh, they had sn uh, sneaked the Bible into the 
um, that old uh, concentration camp they had, and they were able to have Bible studies with some of those, with many of those ladies that were in there. And they noticed the guards were not coming into the prison or into their, so they were free to really have a Bible study. And one day, her, uh, Corey listened to her, her godly sister pray, and of course she's thanking God for the fleas. And Corey Ten Boom just could not believe my sister is thanking you, Lord, for the fleas. And then later on, she found out the reason, uh, oh, the, re the reason the guards weren't coming in. They didn't want to get the fleas. You know, it's interesting, uh, just things like that. Can I thank God for the fleas? No. <laughs> and yes, you know, can I thank God for what he's done in my life? Or am I just going to grumble because there's no water? Like the children in Israel did over and over again. And yet they always found the water, didn't they? One way or the other. And so we see that uh, enter into his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise. Um, and so there again is getting your heart ready to receive God's word. And then he says, be thankful and bless his name. Even when we pray, our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Lifting it up his name and making it special above everything. So we want to hallow the name of our Lord. And then notice, uh, for the Lord is good. There it is. The Lord reigns, but he's good. We know that everything he does is good. And the Bible tells us that in Genesis 1, 31, that he looked on all creation and he saw that it was very good. Now, this was something that the, that was, uh, the, this attribute was the ultimate good in the Jewish mind. And you remember the, in Mark chapter 10, you had the uh, rich young ruler and he came to the Lord and said, good master, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And the Lord Jesus said to him, why call you be good? There's only one good and that's God in heaven. And actually he was saying, are you calling me God? And if you read that, the, the rich young ruler, the next time he says, addresses the Lord, he doesn't say good master. He says, master. He was not willing to accept Jesus as God. And he went away sorrowing. And so we see that uh, again, uh, God is good. And it's just, uh, th this is something uh, that was just embedded in the Jewish mind. God is good. Well, we used to have that little prayer. Um, and I remember fifth and sixth grade, we still prayed that prayer before we'd go to lunch. We'd line up and we'd, we'd pray. It seems so strange today. But God is great. God is good. Uh, let us thank him for our food. By his hand we are fed. Give us this day our daily bread. Dive in. You know, whatever. But, you know, there you go. We said that little ditty. And it didn't mean much but uh, back then, but it sure, at least it was an acknowledgement of the general public there was a God, and it was good. There was a God consciousness that now we see as being stamped out of everything um, today. And so we see that uh, God is good. He's always been good, and he always will be good. No matter what happens in my life, God is good. And so... Not only is good, but endureth forever. His mercy is everlasting. So God latched onto you, and that word mercy means loyal love, never-ending love, endless love that God has for his And so he hates our sin, but he loves our, loves our souls. His mercy is forever. And then also, and his truth endures even until this generation. Now, to all generations. But that means truth is reality. And that means what was true back when this psalm was written about 3,000 years ago, 2,700 years ago, if it's after the, uh, about after the uh, Babylonian captivity, maybe about a little less than 27 years, 100 years, but uh, whatever. Uh, his, his truth is still there. 
And so truth is truth. Reality is reality. And that's what truth means, is reality. And so God is real. And he, and he is reality, which means uh, all things were made by him. And without him was not anything was made. In other words, it's real. If it's real, God made it. Even your thoughts, if they're real, God made them. Sometimes they're a little scattered, but they're real. Amen. And so, but he is, God is real. And as a result, his truth is the same truth today as it was 100 years ago. And it doesn't matter what philosopher, what educated uh, doctor that wants to change the rules today, no truth is truth. In reality is reality. And all these things today we're seeing where truth is being trampled in the streets. And so you really can't know truth. Truth is re a relative, which means that truth is, my truth is different than your truth. No, there's one truth, and that's God. And, either, and anything that is not truth is unrighteous. Right? And so we see that all of sin that comes short of the glory, the righteousness, the truth of God. So his truth never changes. And no matter what the government edict that passed down, no matter what uh, uh, the most popular people around you scorn because you, you believe in old-fashioned things like the love of God and coming to church on Sunday and men and women and marriage and all that stuff, uh, those are all things that are still true. doesn't matter if the whole world rejects it. Amen. Okay, any uh, comments or questions about what we looked at tonight? God is good. <laughs>